now, even here, Lord, to apply your word to our hearts that we can be transformed by it, live according to your word, uh, to live a life that is pleasing to our Lord. And thank you for this, God. Thank you for the clear example in your word uh, of what a church is to be, uh, to what the people are to be like, uh, what the fruit of a genuine transformed heart uh, is, Lord, what it looks like. We praise you and thank you, God, for the miracle of salvation. God, thank you for transforming our hearts. And thank you, Lord, for enlisting us, Lord, in your worship and your praise and in your service. And we are just so thankful, God, so grateful to be a part of that. Uh, we want to be a church. We want to be disciples, Lord, that please you, that are just beautiful testimonies of your grace and of your mercy. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to, to be a part of that, God. Be with us this day as we study your word. If there's anyone here, Lord, that just they've never turned from their sin and put their faith in you, I pray even now, Lord, that you would just break their heart over their sin and show them, Lord, how utterly foolish and destitute life is apart from Christ, apart from salvation, apart from you. And Lord, I, I pray that this would be a time of great edification for the saints, Lord, that you would take these truths from your word. Uh, Lord, pierce our hearts with them that we might apply them and live by them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. And our sermon title today is A Heart for His Church. A Heart for His Church. And we are taking just a brief break here in our walk through the book of Acts to talk about some things that are very important to the future and the life of Christ's church. Christ's church that he purchased with his own blood and our responsibility to that and what role we play in that. So it's a brief Step away, if you will, to take care of some family business in understanding from Scripture what God's plan is for the church and how a godly, healthy, biblical, thriving, and blessed church is not only built but cultivated and maintained. We want to see the Lord continue to work amazingly in our midst. I don't know about you. If you've been here for any length of time, how many of you would say that this church has been a blessing to you? Amen. 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 Since I came here, I've been enormously blessed, myself and my family, by this church. The teaching of this church, the preaching of this church, the fellowship of this church, the love of the brothers, the strong biblical knowledge. The people I, We had a person that came. He's a nationally known, uh, recognized guy. It's been, he goes around doing conferences, and we got an email from him. He was just very encouraging and said that this was the most biblically astute church that he's ever seen, he's ever been a, a part of. And we praise the Lord for that. Is that something that, that we can boast in, that we've done that ourselves? No. Absolutely not. That is a blessing from God. Christ himself has blessed us with that. It comes from him. And that's a blessing that needs to be cultivated and protected and preserved and generated and grown and cherished and treasured and held on to. As the passage we just read said, we want to cling to that which is good and abhor that which is evil. And so to have a church that is blessed by Christ, that is honoring to Christ, that is a testimony to Christ, is having a church that we are hard at work to preserve the things that are treasured in Scripture, that Christ treasures, that we've got to work hard at maintaining for his glory, for him to continue to bless. And there are many elements that go into that. We're going to start a series today called A Heart for His Church because in order for that to be possible, in order to have the church of Christ healthy and thriving and blessed, it starts in the hearts of God's people. Like we've talked about before, church is not simply a nebulous thing. It's not just the four walls of a building. It's not sort of everyone collectively, like the blob. You know, it is individual Christians, individual disciples of Christ. When we talk about the church, I'm talking about you, specifically you, specifically me. We are the church. And if we're going to have a church that honors the Lord, a church that moves forward in the blessing of Christ under the power of the Spirit to accomplish His work in this world, it's going to be a church that moves forward on your shoulders on my shoulders, on our community together. This has been an enormously blessed church. Enormously blessed. And I, I think about just the Lord leading me here. I spent my entire life in false churches with false gospels, under false teachers, 
not hearing the truth of God's word. And I came out completely deceived. And when, I, when God led me to this church, and I heard the truth of the word of God, and I saw what a, a genuine Christian looks like, and how people love one another and obey the word of God and have a, a heart to please the Lord and want to obey and want to live for him wholeheartedly, and that church isn't a bunch of hypocrites, and church isn't just a, a superficial, fake, social gathering of people together that just come to church on Sunday to see what Betty is wearing or what Sally's going to do that afternoon. That church is, church is the body of Christ and that we've been knit together by Christ. We've been brought together by Christ. You look around this room and the vast majority of us would have never known one another at all had not Christ brought us together. Our paths just would have never crossed. But the Lord has promised to build his church, and he's doing that. And he's given us here just a, a wonderful body of believers. Now, we've been through some tough times, haven't we? But a tribute, a testimony to the faithfulness of God is that even through difficult times, look at the folks that are here. This is our family. This is our body. This is Christ's body. This is Christ's church. And that's a testimony to the goodness and grace and mercy of God. That's a testimony to the, the health and vitality and vibrancy that God, that Christ himself with his own blood, has infused here for the blessing and the benefit of this body, for the furtherance of his kingdom, as a testimony of what a church is to be. And so we have something that's, that's precious. The church is precious. This church is precious. And those many, I grew up not understanding that, not thinking of church as precious, just thinking of church as something I had to do on a Sunday. But the body of Christ, the fellowship of like-minded people, the, the love of the saints, the fellowship of the brothers, being of like precious faith and practice with other genuine Christians is the way that God designed the church to work. He's the way that, it's the way that he designed his work to go forward into the world. It's the way Christ established the church to stand in opposition to the world as a strict contrast between him and the wicked world around us. And this is a beautiful testimony of his work, of his effort, of his shed blood to provide it for us. And it is precious. And it is worthy to be cherished and treasured. And that comes with responsibility. Here's how Christ feels about his church. We take from Ephesians 5 and this analogy given by Paul with husbands loving their wives. And in verse 25 to 27, Paul says, Husband, love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. And here's how you're to love them. Here's the example of Christ. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. For the purpose that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present this church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Does Christ love his church? Amen. Amen. This is his bride, and he is laboring through you, laboring through me, through his people, his disciples, to present the church, a glorious church, to himself on that day, not having any spot or wrinkle, not having any blemish, to be holy, to cleanse her, to wash her, to sanctify her. And again, that's not some nebulous thing. That is you individually. That is me individually. That we're to be washed, sanctified. That we're to be without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. So that one day, in that great day, when the church is called home to the marriage supper of the Lamb, the bride is presented to Christ for His glory and for His eternal praise. That's what the church is. That's what the body of Christ is. That's what the church is to be about. The eternal praise and glory of Christ. And that's what we're about. That's what we're to be about. Christ said he loved his church in Acts 20, 28. It's the church that he purchased with his own blood. In 1 Timothy 3, 15, the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. His truth. 
Christ loves his church. And that comes with great, great, great responsibility for all of us. It comes with great personal responsibility for you specifically and individually. For me specifically, it comes with great responsibility for each one of us. We've said that this church is a blessing. The church, the church of Jesus Christ, is a great blessing. Will you labor to preserve it? Will you labor to cultivate it? Will you labor to press forward its teachings, to press forward its doctrine, to press forward its sanctification, to push forward for its blessing, to push forward for the gospel? What are you prepared to do to labor with Christ for his church? We've been walking through the book of Acts, and we've seen that even though Christ is ascended, his work continues through Peter. Even though Christ is sitting at the right hand of his father, the labor continues through Paul and Barnabas. And we've made that application that even though Christ has ascended, his work in the earth continues through his disciples, through his church. And it's the work of the church that is doing the work of the Lord in the earth and is a, an example and a testimony to a lost and dying world that needs Christ. That's the church. Will you labor for it? Will you labor with Christ for it? A healthy, thriving, biblical, blessed church is not something that happens by accident. It takes great personal responsibility. It takes great personal effort. It takes great strides. And that's not simply by those that are elders or those that are teachers, or those that are deacons. It's by every single person. It's by every disciple. The Bible is very clear that we've all been given gifts and that those gifts work together for the beauty, for the glory, for the sanctification, for the edification of Christ's church. And we're all to play a part in that. We're all to employ our giftedness to make sure that that happens. We all have personal responsibility. This doesn't happen by accident. What we've been blessed with here is not an accident. What, Christ's true church is not an accident. It doesn't happen because people just come together under some social scheme or under some click or under some gathering birds of a feather flocking together it doesn't happen because of that it doesn't happen by accident and we have to be able to recognize the fundamentals that make for a strong healthy solid thriving biblical church and then we've got to labor to preserve that we've got to be laboring not to allow those things to slip we see churches in revelation 2 revelation 3 that started strong planted by the Apostle Paul himself under fierce persecution that thrived. And then a matter of a few decades later, we've got a church that is dead with only a few that have not soiled their garments. We've got a church that is lukewarm and Christ is on the outside of the church pounding on the door to get in. Unless we are faithful to the Lord, unless we are diligent to preserve and cultivate the blessings that God has given us in the church will slip into the same pattern. We have to labor not to allow that to happen. Our blessing through this church only comes by the grace and mercy of God under the power of this, the Holy Spirit through your faithfulness, through my faithfulness, through our work together. And we've talked about this as a family and we saw in Acts 14 again that we see that our relationship together is most often referred to in Scripture as family, through the words brothers and sisters, and that we together have responsibility to do that. That's going to come by God's grace, only according to His Spirit. That's not a monergistic work on the part of God alone. Sanctification is a synergistic work with us together as community. We work doggedly to preserve. We work doggedly to sanctify. We work doggedly to labor for this church knowing completely that it all depends on God but we have a responsibility to labor for it and isn't it a blessing to labor for something that's such a blessing <laughs> don't you just want to do that when you think about all that God has done for us you think about this beautiful church and you and and the teaching and the people and the love for one another and the word of God and the evangelism and the testimonies and doesn't it just spur you on to want to labor for it that's because God has blessed us. But this is only comes, and this is what we need to understand. 
this blessing, the church as we know it, the church as Christ has instituted it, only comes through obedience out of a transformed heart. It only flows out of proper spiritual attitudes that come as a result of salvation, as a result of genuine saving faith, in other words, out of a regenerate heart from a genuine disciple of Christ. It only happens under the work and labor of people who are genuinely saved. It's impossible any other way. It simply will not happen apart from genuine salvation. So without a doubt, the critical issue, if we're to start our series today, A Heart for His Church, and we're going to look at the next several weeks on the spiritual attitudes, the spiritual disciplines, the spiritual commitments that are necessitated by the Word of God for a healthy, strong, thriving, biblical, blessed church, we need to understand that the critical issue with respect to that is our own hearts. Your heart, my heart, our fervency for the Lord, our love for Christ, our devotion to Him and His Word. It all flows out of our heart together. A healthy, godly church begins with the condition of your own heart. And I don't mean that in a nebulous way, speaking of the church collectively. I mean you individually, me personally. It flows out of the condition of our own heart. And if we want to preserve and cultivate a great love for His church, this church, then as the Bible says, we must strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather healed. This is what we're going to take time to do. To come together as a body, come together as a family, to take a few weeks together and to talk about, to work through, to think through scripturally, what is it that makes the church so blessed? What is it that we do together? What is it that we have responsibility for to carry this church forward? I look forward to many, many years, until the Lord brings me home, until he comes back, whichever comes first, of serving the Lord with you in this church. Uh, it has been just a tremendous blessing to do that already. Uh, whether I was on staff here or the first day I walked in this building, was just thrilled to be here and just so happy to be a part of this church. And so looking forward to many, many years of laboring with you for this church. We need to take some time now and think through scripturally what that entails. We need to have our priorities straight. We need to have our minds straight. We need to be on the same page with what spiritual disciplines are necessary to make it happen. Our heart, our attitudes, what we're willing to commit. And all of that for the sake of His church. It's not our church not my church, not your church in that sense. It's his church, a church that he purchased with his own blood. And so I want to start by giving you a couple of examples. And if you will, turn your Bibles to 1 Peter 1, and let's take a look at the first one here. 1 Peter 1. God, as we've seen, and we've seen this throughout the book of Acts, the Lord sanctifies his church through trial. He sanctifies you individually as a Christian through trial, through difficulty. We've seen that through trial and difficulty comes bolstered faith, comes perseverance, steadfastness in the faith. It's what we need to endure to the end so that we may be saved, right? And here is no different. In this first letter of Peter, this church was under great persecution, having great difficulty. We've been through a little difficulty ourselves, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, we've been through some difficulty. And it is not easy all the time. And the Lord doesn't promise that it will be. Matter of fact, the Lord promises that through much tribulation, you must enter the kingdom of God. And so that's what the Lord promises. And we've got to be ready for that and willing to, for the Lord's sake, for our own sake, for our own good, to go through that with the proper attitudes and the proper understanding. And that's what Peter's going to give us here. He's going to give us the proper attitudes, the proper understanding what our heart needs to look like and what we need to do flowing from our heart to make it through. So if you look at 1 Peter 1 and look at verse 3, we're going to see the commands here and the responses of a genuine Christian through trial. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God 
through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Instantaneously, now these folks are in great trial, great difficulty, and what does Peter do here? He gives them encouragement. And the encouragement is this. When you're in difficulty, when you're in trial, whether it's a trial in your own personal life, whether we go through trial together as a church, as a family, whatever our difficulty is, what Peter's saying here is that as a disciple of Christ, you look past your temporal earthly difficulty. You look past that present real trial that you're in and you look forward to your hope. You look forward to your inheritance. You look forward with joy at your salvation. That you focus on the things that are important. We are simply pilgrims here. We're not citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven. We're just passing through. We are aliens and sojourners, and we have a great inheritance to look forward to. We have a great hope in heaven to look forward to. And so first Peter's, his first inclination here is to say, listen, I know you've got it hard. I know this has been tough, but look past those present circumstances and look to Christ. Look at the hope reserved in heaven for you. Look at the powerful keeping of God through your faith through salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Look forward to your inheritance and look forward with hope. So here, that's our first inclination. That's our first command. That's our first example. When you're in trial, you look past temporal earthly difficulty and you look forward to your hope that is in heaven. Look at verse 6. In this now, Peter says, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. And Paul calls them momentary, light afflictions, producing for us a far greater weight of glory. Verse 7, the reason for those trials is that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Reflecting on our salvation, reflecting on the inheritance we have in Christ, reflecting on the hope of heaven and the glories of heaven, produces joy. Produces joy. When you have hope, hope comes with its virtually twin brother, joy. When you have hope in Christ, and you have hope of heaven, hope in him, then it's going to produce joy. Isaiah 61.10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Now, mind you, this is a decision. Isaiah here says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm resolving my heart. I'm making up my mind. Train is leaving the station. I will greatly rejoice in my Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Here, Isaiah is adorning himself with joy in the Lord. That's a joy in the Lord because of the hope of heaven, because of the inheritance that we have to look forward to. Psalm 511 says, But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy, because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. You see how to, the, the attitudes of a changed heart, the attitudes of a transformed spirit, a transformed nature, that of the attitude of that changed heart comes an attitude of love for God, a love for His Word, a love for Christ, which results itself in hope, which results itself in joy. It's all a part of God's program and it's miraculously that just by god's grace and mercy that can get you through anything and how many of you here would say i've been through really hard times and if it weren't for the lord i don't think i would have made it yeah. i mean it, the lord and it's it's that joy and that hope that comes only in him but now this trial here this trial that these folks that peter is writing to are going through also produces proven faith in addition to the hope, in addition to the joy, their faith is tested. Their faith is matured. Their faith is grown, and it produces steadfastness. It produces patience. It produces endurance to the end by which we're saved. Christ is worthy of a sanctified bride, isn't he? When it says in his word 
in Ephesians 5, that he will present to himself a glorious church, not having any spot or wrinkle, any blemish? Isn't Christ worthy of that? Well, that comes through trial. That comes through difficulty. It comes through persecution. It comes through suffering. That's the way that Christ is sanctifying his bride. He washes them with water by the word. He takes the church through trial. He grows their faith. He sanctifies them. And Christ is worthy of a sanctified bride. I was reading in Religious Affections this week by Jonathan Edwards, and he has a quote in there I thought was very appropriate. Edwards said, True virtue never appears so lovely as when it is most oppressed. Now think about that for a second. True virtue never appears so lovely as when it is most oppressed. And the divine excellency of real Christianity is never exhibited with such advantage as when under the greatest of trials. Then it is that true faith that it appears much more precious than gold, and upon this account is found to praise and honor and glory. This is the passage that he's referring to. It's under a great trial, under great difficulty, under great fire, under great testing that our faith is matured, that your faith, it's a gift of God, is, that it shines. That your trust and dependence on Him shines. Edwards knew that. And we need to have a right understanding of that. As we move forward as a church, move forward as a family, we move forward through trial, through difficulty together, that moving forward is with the right heart attitude of joy in the Lord. We're not to be disgruntled. We're not to be discontented. We're not to be grumbling complainers in the desert in our tent. We've got the Lord's provision of food every day, the Lord's provision of water, the Lord's pr provision of himself. We're not to be grumbling and discontent and disheartened. We're to be joyful in the Lord. We're to be hopeful in him. We're to rest in him. And here, we're going to see this response on the part of these folks. Peter is going to move from indicative statements of fact now to imperative statements of command. He's going to go from statements of reality now to applying this to their hearts. And this applies in three different ways. Look at verse 13. They've got this hope, and they've got joy in their salvation, but they, that, that demands a response and this is heart attitudes, the condition of your heart tied to proper living, right conduct. Look at verse 13. Therefore, Peter says, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He says, fix your hope fully. And that fully there means comprehensively, completely. We have a hope in the Lord and a hope of Christ that is unquestionable and it's based in his faithfulness and so we can rest our hope fully and completely on him it has nothing to do with us nothing to do with our own human effort to try to achieve it or accomplish it it's everything to do with christ everything to do with the faithfulness of god and it comes as a result of his promise it is complete and unreserved and so we can rest our hope fully in him without doubting at all james 1 says he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And that brings to mind that this is not simply an emotion. This isn't simply a, an emotional reaction, uh, an emotional or a feeling reaction. This is an act of your will. When Peter says to fix your hope, he is speaking there of an act of your will. Just like Isaiah decided i will be joyful and i will rejoice in my lord in the same way we're to fix our hope and it's an act of our will if you think about it hope is the christian's complete attitude spiritual attitude spiritual heart about his future and if you are in christ do you have any better future is there any possibility of any other future better than the future you've got if you're in christ You've got a hope of heaven, a, a hope of being with him for all eternity. And so it's a Christian's attitude toward the future. If you've got the attitude that is befitting a child of God about your future, it results in hope. 
There's simply no other result. There's simply no other thing that it could result in. It's going to result in hope and hope's twin brother, joy. <laughs> and that's what comes. It's not despair. It's not anxiety. It's not worry. It's not discontentedness. It's not complaining and grumbling. It's hope. Trusting God, faith for the present, hope is merely future faith. It's a saying, I know what the Lord is doing, and it's good. I know where we're headed. I know my eventual destination. I know the inheritance that God has promised for those that love him and keep his commandments. And so I have hope based in Christ, hope based in God. It's faith in your future. It's future faith. That's hope. It's trusting God for what comes. Trusting God for what comes. It's based in God's promises and in his faithfulness. And it produces joy. Titus 2, 11 through 14 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, it means we need to learn it, right? This is something we need to learn. That we need to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope. The blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Now instantly in that passage in Titus, you can see how hope and rejoicing out of the heart results in right living, results in right conduct. It's so that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for what? For good works. That's what hope in Christ produces. When you have the right heart, the right heart leads to right living. If you've got a heart that's transformed by Christ, the inevitable, the inevitable fruit of that is right conduct. If you say that I know him, but you don't keep his commandments, the Bible says that you're a liar. For the truth of God is not in you. The fruit of genuine saving faith is obedience to Christ and his commands. Out of a loving heart, out of a grateful heart, out of a rejoicing heart, out of a transformed, regenerate heart. And it will absolutely react that way. That's exactly what's going to happen. Now he says here, this hope is prepared in two ways. There are two pre preparatory participles here that lead to this fixing of hope. Look at verse 13. Now the main point is that you fix your hope. And this happens two ways. Therefore, one, gird up the loins of your mind. Two, be sober. This girding up the loins of your mind refers literally, it's, it's like uh, in the first century, they had the long garments, and if somebody was going to take off running in one of those long garments, they're going to trip and fall over, stumble all over themselves. So what did they have to do? They had to take up those garments, pull them up around their waist so that they could run and not get entangled in them. So when he's saying girding up your loins, it's girding up all those loose ends, taking up that loose robe, gathering that thing up so that you can get down to business. So you're to gird up your robe, you're to gird up your mind, prepare your mind, you're to fix your priorities, in other words. You're to discipline your thoughts. You're to disentangle yourself from sin's entanglements so that we can run the race that God has given us to run. We're to prepare our mind, prepare our heart to resolve ourselves. In girding up our loins, we resolve ourselves to doing the work that the Lord has given us, to following hard after Him. And what we're talking about in having a heart for His church is that that entails real, rubber-meets-the-road, hammer-to-nail service of the Lord in His church. By you individually, by me individually, serving Him. We need to do that to gird up our loins, to have hope. But next it says to be sober. Sober, not intoxicated. It means not out of control. It goes hand in hand with a clarity of mind, a clarity of heart, ready, prepared for what lies ahead. Not mean merely getting sideswiped or blindsided by things, but prepared for what lies ahead. Spiritual self steadfastness and self control. Not out of control, self control. It's a fruit of the Spirit. All of that, girding up your loins, being sober, enables you to rest your hope. Fix your hope on Christ. That's something that we've got to be ready to do. But it goes on now. This produces the response in the Christian of hope. Like we said, that's an act of will. We are to be hopeful. But it also produces something else here. It produces holiness. Look at verse 14. 
as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Genuine hope, real hope. We, I'm not talking about fake, sham hope, empty hope. I'm talking about real, genuine hope that comes as a basis, as a foundation that comes with knowing Christ. That real, genuine hope leads to, will result in holiness of life. It just can't be any other way. If you have a heart that loves Christ and you're looking forward to your hope, it results itself in holiness of life that flows out of a spiritual attitude, a heart attitude of hope. 1 John 3, 3 says, And everyone and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. True hope leads to holiness. Now, this is not a legalistic holiness. This is not a heartless or a cold holiness. Genuine heart holiness flows out of a genuine heart. It's out of a heart that loves Christ. And many, you talk to them, I'm sure, knocked at the door, had countless conversations with guys that any kind of striving for holiness, any kind of trying to live for the Lord, any kind of exertion to that end, they would view as legalism. And for a long time, there was a theology going around, let go and let God. It's still out there. Why are you trying so hard? What are you getting so worked up about? Why are you so worried about your sin? That's just going to be natural to a Christian. You just live your life. God, take care of the rest. It's simply not a biblical attitude. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. Purifies himself just as he is pure. Hope leads to holiness. It's not a legalistic holiness. Legalism is not holiness, but holiness is not legalism. We're to live for the Lord. With that in mind, it becomes apparent, and it says so in Scripture, that the basic character of a Christian, the basic character of a disciple of Christ, is obedience, is a life of holiness, separated to God, living for Him. That's the basic character of of a Christian. When the world looks at a Christian, they're to see something different than the world. That's the way God has designed it. The basic character of a non-Christian, the Bible says, they are sons of disobedience. Sons of disobedience. They're of their father, the devil. This produces, this hope produces holiness of life. But that holiness of life comes from a right heart. And it can only, we'll talk about that in a moment, it can only come from a right heart. Otherwise, it is empty and shallow, and the Lord despises it. It can only come from a transformed heart that loves the Lord. But now let, next, look at verse 17. This also produces a fear of the Lord. Verse 17, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. I think about the motivation behind that statement. You were redeemed, not with trinkets of this world, not with gold or silver. You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. And would not that motivate in you a fear of the Lord to live holy for Him? You were purchased with the blood of Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And would that not motivate you with great hope and joy and thanksgiving and gratefulness in your heart to live for Him? Because you were purchased with his blood. And it says here in 17, you call on the Father without partiality. He judges according to each one's work. The reason that God can judge according to a Christian's work is because the Christian's work is not dependent on that, that person. Your righteousness is the righteousness of another. It's the righteousness of Christ. And that's the only hope that you have. It's the only hope that I have. But this fear here, it produces great reverence, great honor, great respect for the Lord. It's also a, a fear of, of disobeying Him. Don't you fear disobeying your Lord? I just want to please Him. I want to live for Him. The chastening hand of God. 
And God says that he chastens those whom he loves as a father chastens his own son. And that's a blessing from God that we have that. But we want to obey him. And that comes, if you're a Christian, that comes out of the right heart. It comes out of a heart that is motivated by love for your Lord. But this also comes with a purpose. We have hope in Christ. That hope produces holiness and a fear of the Lord. And it comes with a purpose. And this purpose, this hope, this holiness is for our church. It's for you individually. But look at chapter 2 down in verse 11. He continues and he says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. You individually as a Christian are to have a good testimony with the world. Us as a church are to have a good testimony with the world in the sense that when they respond to us and unjustly condemn, persecute, or judge the church as being a church full of evildoers, it's by your conduct that the reverse is proven true. It's by your conduct, your faithfulness to the Lord, our testimony as a church, you as a Christian, your testimony is to be a testimony of Christ so that in the end, no one may, may speak against you. No one won't have anything to say about you because you're living for the Lord. They were unjustly spoken of as evildoers, unjustly persecuted, unjustly slandered. We have to have honorable conduct in the midst of that. We can see through this passage in Peter, when we looked at Titus, there's a direct connection between the right heart and the right conduct. And that's the way it has to be. It cannot be any other way. The right conduct, the conduct that is pleasing to the Lord, can only be done in faith and faith in Christ can only be done for the Lord in that way. Otherwise, it's despicable, deplorable conduct. This conduct, this right conduct, is holiness. Christ himself said, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. This conduct cannot be propped up by artificial means. It can't be looked at as a means for right standing with God. It can't be done outside of saving faith in Christ. It can't be done apart from genuine repentance, turning from sin, turning from idols to serve the true and living God. And it's simply the definitive and inevitable fruit of a transformed heart. And so let's talk about the heart for a moment. If we're going to have a heart for his church, if our church is going to be the glorious church that we want it to be, to be presented to Christ in that day without spot or wrinkle, to be sanctified, to be holy, then that is going to flow out of the heart your heart, my heart, not a nebulous thing. When you join a church, when you become a member, when you attach yourself to a church, you are attaching yourself to a body, to a family that is linked arms, moving the same direction for Christ, accomplishing his purposes in the way that he commands, in the way that's pleasing to him. We're attaching ourselves to Christ in that way, and that has to flow out of the heart. The context of the word heart represents in scripture a person's will their affections their desires it's literally who a person is it's your makeup who you are as a person your heart reveals your true nature and your true motivation if you think to yourself as paul said to, to test yourself whether you're in the faith if you're going to do a self-examination your heart will reveal your true nature and your true motivation I remember using this analogy i use it all the time when i'm witnessing to people I absolutely despise liver. Can't stand it. Uh, I don't even want to be in the room with it. I just, you know, the smell alone is enough to, I want to get away. You put a hot, stinking plate of liver on the counter, and I'm going to, I think I have no interest. I can't, I won't even feed that to the dog, okay? But now, you put a plate of hot, steaming lasagna on the counter, and I have absolutely no problem with that. It's that, that because it's, now some of you love liver. I don't understand that. You may. You may hate lasagna. That's in our makeup. It's part of our DNA. It's part of who we are. It's part of our nature. It would take a miracle of God for me to, a miracle of God, <laughs> for me to love the liver and hate the lasagna. I would have to be completely reworked, right? Out of a transformed heart, when you were in your sin before Christ, you loved the things of this world. You were making provision for the flesh. You were 
You just wanted to get to that next thing, that next sin. That's just what you were about. You delighted in that. And it was begrudging to have to give any of that up. If you were lost and you were trying to quit smoking, lost and trying to quit drinking, whatever you're trying to quit, and you loved it, boy, it's begrudging that you're, you're only doing that because, well, it's healthier, so I gotta. But you delighted in it. When you come to Christ and God transforms your heart, transforms you from the inside out and makes you a new creature in Christ, then your desires are transformed. Your heart is transformed. Your mind is transformed. Your emotions transformed. Your affections transformed. You become a new person. And so your new desires, your new heart, the new things that you delight in testify of a transformed heart. Testify about you that you've been converted by God. Without that, you simply haven't been converted. All of that flows out of the right heart. And that will, will, will inevitably result in what you do. It results in your actions. Jeremiah 17.10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that outside of God's grace in Christ, your heart is deceitful above all things. Think about that. Above all things. More deceitful than Satan. Your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Irretrievably wicked. Hopelessly wicked, apart from the work of God in salvation. You are commanded to love the Lord your God with all of it. According to Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 3, your repentance, the truth of your repentance, is determined by whether you, or not you turn to the Lord with all of it. It's to be all of it. You're to love the Lord with all of it. You're to turn in repentance with all of it. According to Luke 12, 34, where your treasure is, that's where it's going to be too. Your heart is where your treasure is. In Matthew 13, it's represented by four different soils for the seed of the gospel, one of which is saving the other three are not. As Luther said, apart from Christ, your heart is a factory for idols. What flows out of it, according to Christ, is what defiles a man. And it is that which is the inside of the cup that God is most concerned with. He's concerned with the inside of your cup. Now that being said, think about that for a moment. The heart, and like we said last week, the center of faith, but also a a display of sorrow and anxiety and worry and sin, all of that wrapped up in the same thing. It can be easily tripped up. It can easily be led astray. And there are serious pitfalls that you can fall into. We as a church, together, have to avoid, individually and collectively, avoid two main pitfalls if we're to have the right heart for the Lord. First and foremost, you got to be genuinely saved. You've got to be genuinely, you, by turning from your sin, putting your faith in Christ alone, you must be regenerate. You must be converted. You must be born again. You must be saved. You must be following the Lord with all of this heart. You must be saved. As a disciple of Christ, we have pitfalls that we can fall into. One pitfall is the pitfall of legalism, moralism, duty, external conformity. The other ditch, the other pitfall is license licentiousness, easy believism. And we've got to avoid these two ditches with everything that we've got if we want to have a, a church that honors the Lord, a church that's blessed by God. And it starts with your heart, your heart personally. Until you are overrun with the gospel, overrun with Christ's love and grace and mercy in the gospel and saving you from your sins, you're simply not going to have that kind of heart. You need to be so overrun by God's mercy in Christ in saving your wretched soul that you would charge hell with a squirt gun and do it right now, both guns blaring. That's the heart of the disciple of Christ. It's a heart that out of a love for Christ, out of a love for his church, that you live for him. You serve him and obey him, and it'll flow out of that kind of heart. As long as you think of church or living the Christian life as a series of duties that you have to do under pressure, you're in legalism. You're in the wrong heart. The wrong, you're in morality, external conformity. You're in a mindset of simply duty. 
And you think of it this way. Here's a list of stuff I need to do. God will be pleased with me if I do it. And so now I just got to round up the willpower to get it done. If you think it that way, if that's the way, bottom line, it comes down to it for you, then you're in simply morality, external conformity. It's simply duty. It's not out of a love for God, out of a love for Christ. It's like walking on a crutch when you have your leg. <laughs> you simply have a prop. You're not using the leg, which in its power and in the, the, the health that God has given you, could walk. You're simply propping yourself up on a crutch. And what happens when that crutch gets taken out of the way? Do you fall? You can't use the crutch. Uh, you have, sometimes you need a crutch. Sometimes you need accountability. You need brothers coming alongside you, calling you to their side, right? Parakaleo, like we talked about last week. Exhorting, comforting, encouraging, strengthening, motivating, holding accountable. We need that sometimes. So sometimes we need that crutch, but it's foolish and deadly to use the crutch in place of Christ. To use the crutch in place of faith and genuine faith, heart holiness. The pursuit of holiness will be transformed when you are following Christ by faith. When you're following Christ out of genuine love from a pure heart. When you're commanded from Scripture, do you say, well, I'll do this because it's my duty. Well, that is legalism, morality, external conformity, duty, and it's man-centered. Or do you say, I do this because I love Christ and I want to please Him. That's spiritual discipline. That's a love for the Lord. That's God-centered. Legalism points to holiness as a matter of human effort alone or of human achievement. Heart holiness constantly looks to Christ by faith and by God's supernatural enablement and empowerment constantly looks to Christ by faith. I saw this quote in reading for this week, and it came from uh, Oxford History of English Literature talking about William Tyndale. And we have this misconception sometimes of Puritans and how Puritans lived or how they viewed Christianity, how they viewed the faith. Sometimes we see them as cold, stodgy, sort of just, you know, gritting it out, just doing what we're supposed to do kind of thing. And it's simply not the way they were. <laughs> and William Tyndale uh, is another example of this. Um, and it, here's what they said about William Tyndale. The fact is that morality or duty, what Tyndale calls the law, never made a man happy in himself or dear to others. You've ever been around a legalist for any length of time? They are joyless people, and they want you to be joyless right there with them. They're going to do everything they can to suck joy out of you. <laughs> they just vacuum it out of the room, right? It is shocking, but it is undeniable. We do not wish either to be or to live among people who are clean or honest or kind as a matter of duty. We want to be and associate with people who like being clean and honest and kind. The mere suspicion that what seemed an act of spontaneous friendliness or generosity was really done as a duty subtly poisons it. Now think about that for a second. If you're going to, for someone, hey, do something kind, compassionate, generous, loving, and yet you're doing that simply as a sense of duty, as a, because you feel like as though you had to or you should, can you see how corrupted it becomes? How poisonous that is? And so now magnify that to infinity, <laughs> And think about your external conformity with respect to obeying Christ. Your morality when it comes to simply, in your own effort, grudging it out. It's a matter of duty. i got to do it. When you obey the Lord, who redeemed you with his own blood. <laughs> that's just, uh, that extra, that's why legalism is so ugly. And why, is that external morality, that's why God hates it. These people profess me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That is laden with righteous anger, righteous indignation over gross sin. We're to be loving and doing, serving the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, all our main, mind, all our strength, all the time, 
out of a loving heart. And it is simply, simply a decision of your will. The Lord saved me, and I love him, and I want to please him, and I will do all I can to serve him and to live for him. He goes on to say that this moralism is completely self-destructive, and it's only healthy when it's destroying itself. I say amen to that. It goes on, in theological language, no man can be saved by works. The whole purpose of the gospel is to deliver us from this kind of morality. Thus, paradoxically, the Puritan of modern imagination, the cold, gloomy heart, just doing as duty what happier and richer souls would do without thinking about it, is precisely the enemy that they rose up to smite. And boy, it needs smiting. It needs a complete smackdown. <laughs> Because it robs joy. It robs obedience to Christ out of the right heart. Heart holiness, not just a mindless drudgery. Legalism, morality, conformity, duty in that sense, is rules with no relationship. It's emphasizing standards over the Savior. It's based on fear and joyless introspection and hypocritical judgmentalism. It produces hopelessness and futility rather than freedom. However, to many, the idea of living for Christ, strictly according to what the Bible says, is all of it branded as legalism. But can you see how the right heart, that's the heart that God wants for you in Christ, that's the heart out of which we're to obey the Lord in Christ, that's no subtle poisoning that's out of a love for the Lord. And that's the obedience. That's the fruit that that produces. And we can go from one ditch into the other ditch. One ditch of legalism, morality, conformity, duty, into the other ditch of license. I um, remember a, a high school buddy of mine had four kids in the car with him going through our neighborhood, and we had this S-curve. The front wheel of his car that was behind him slipped off the edge of the pavement and so, slippery roads, it had been raining. He s pulled the wheel back to get himself back on the road. And when he did, he overcorrected. And it flung him all the way across the road into a concrete, a brick column, mailbox, uh, killing the girl in the back seat. For you, for me, to overcorrect from living with that duty conforming, that kind of mindset, to then overcorrect to say, well, I'll just obey the Lord if I want to in this area. I'll disobey Him if I want to in this area. I'll live for Him this way if I want to over here. I won't, I'll, I'll do it this way. I won't do it that way. And you're, again, you're back over here in easy believism. You're back in, over here in low commitment, in disobedience. You have pulled that car across the road into the other ditch, and you are killing yourself. It's... Both ditches, and both must be avoided. We can't be in either ditch. We've got to be right down the center of the road. Paul in Galatians, very concerned about the Galatians and their tendency toward legalism, towards works righteousness. Today in our day and age, with the influence of the world around us, the influence of the professing church around us toward license and easy believism, we've got to do the hard work of staying in the middle of the road, serving Christ with a fervent heart. And that's going to be with fervency. You've got to avoid license. Those that believe that way, literally anything that brings conviction or pressure is legalistic. Anything that brings conviction is not any more the natural or easy yoke of Jesus Christ. It's excusable, and it should be. The Spirit brings conviction, and they rebuke the Spirit because they think it's the devil trying to condemn them. And they do all this at the expense of their own soul. So what is the antidote for this? The antidote is we embrace a transformed heart in Christ, in the power of the Spirit, and we choose, decide to go forward in Christ, in the power of the Spirit, with that heart, and obey Him with everything we've got. We live for Him with all our heart. We live for Him with all our soul. We do everything we can to serve the Lord in this church to make this a glorious church for His honor, for His glory, for His namesake with the right heart attitude. Not propped up with a crutch, 
not in the ditch of morality, certainly not in the ditch of license, but with a right heart to follow the Lord, with the spiritual attitudes of hope, joy, love, gratefulness, enabled by God's grace, aggressively dealing with sin and resolving our hearts to obey him. This is heart holiness. This is the heart that the Lord gives us. This is what's needed. Edwards said, universal experience shows that the exercise of the affections has in a special manner a tendency to some sensible effect on the body. In other words, a person acts in accordance with their own affections, their own desires. But then he goes on to say, we may well then suppose that the greater those affections be and the more vigorous their exercise, the greater the effect on the body. In other words, when you've got a heart on fire, you're going to live like it. And so we inflame, and we pray the Lord to inflame our hearts for love for Him, gratefulness to Him, hope in Him, joy in Him. And it's out of that heart, a heart for His church in that way, that His church is built and blessed, and the gospel goes out, the work gets done. Holiness is the main hunger and thirst of the Christian for Christ's sake. And men are inclined to do those things that they love and they delight in. It's just simply natural. And so the right heart, then, will produce the right attitudes, which will lead to right living in a glorious church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you and thank you, Lord, for your teaching, uh, from your word. Lord, the, just the blessed reality, Lord, of a, a heart, a transformed heart. Lord, when we've been genuinely saved and you've, you've Lord, opened our eyes and made us alive in Christ and you given us the new heart that the new covenant speaks about. God, we praise you and thank you for that. Thank you, God, that you've not left us, Lord, to our despicable flesh that rebels against you, that just finds in the sacrifice of Christ nothing more than simply a response of morality, of duty, of heartless obedience. But praise you, Lord. Praise you, God, that you have transformed our, our hearts. Lord, you've, you've washed us clean, forgiven us, God, given us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand so that out of a heart that loves you, that takes great joy, rejoices in your salvation, that Lord, just hungers and thirsts for righteousness, that we can obey you in faith, through faith in Christ, by the power of your Spirit, and live a life that pleases you, Lord, that can contribute and serve you in a church that just a, a blazing beacon, a testimony of your goodness and grace. We praise you, Lord, for that. God, find us faithful to do that. Inflame our hearts uh, to be in bold, constant, devoted, uncompromising service to you for your namesake, for your glory, for your church, for your bride, or that will be presented to you one day without spot or wrinkle. Praise you and thank you, Lord, for your church. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.